Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me on this Friday afternoon. I think there's still some more people um, that are going to join, so I'll just give it another one or two minutes. And while we're waiting for more people to join, um, could you please just indicate to me in the chat box um, that you can hear me? And that you can see my screen as well. Thanks, Anin. Are you seeing the right screen now? I'm just going to give it another few seconds and then we will kick off. Okay, it's three minutes past, so I think I'm going to go ahead. So um, thanks again for joining everyone and welcome to uh, my webinar talking about enhancing the value of your real EBIT model. Um, in the ad and the invite, um, we talked about your BIM model, but um, today's presentation is going to be specifically um, related to, to modeling in Revit. Um, so for that reason, we're talking about enhancing the value of your EBIT model. So uh, just as an introduction of myself, uh, my name is Nuran and I am a BIM Technical Specialist here at Baker Baines, uh, particularly working in the AC industry. I um, practiced as a structural engineer before joining Baker Baines in October last year. And uh, my previous experience um, relates to rivet modeling as well as um, administering some projects on BIM 360. And my design experience is mostly in multi-story residential, industrial, and uh, educational buildings. So you will hear a lot of uh, industrial buildings um, uh, talks and examples today, but of course, everything um, in this webinar can be related to any other kind of project in the AEC industry. And then a little bit of an introduction of who Baker Baines is. So uh, some of you, um, some of you might be uh, familiar uh, with who we are and what we do. But for those of you who are not um, Baker Baines, we are uh, basically a consulting uh, company for for other uh, architects and engineers. Um, we've evolved over the last five years from being um, a Autodesk reseller to also offering some other consulting services as well um, for adopting uh, these types of software. Um, we 
basically focus on four uh, main areas of work, including um, business process improvement consulting. We also do server and design hardware consulting, um, and then other design software consulting. Um, and uh, we also focus on providing bl uh, blended learning to our customers, um, and we are a provider of uh, that kind of uh, CAD learning in particular, which is um, an e-learning platform. Um, and then uh, besides um, Autodesk, we also are partnered with some other um, um, software providers and hardware providers as well. Um, we also um, uh, sell and provide consulting for Topcon and Leica projects for survey uh, uh, survey information. Um, and then, like I mentioned, uh, CAD Learning as well, which is our online platform that we, we help to encourage our customers to make um, use of learning even throughout uh, throughout the, the journey on the, the BIM journey. Um, and then another thing we are very proud of is that we are now BE Level 1 contributor. So um, that was a nice little um, win for us this year. So uh, now that you know a bit about me, I would like to get to know you as well. Um, so I am just going to launch a poll and I would like you to just indicate to me uh, if you are a Revit user. Um, you should be seeing it on your screen and I will just give everyone a few seconds uh, to answer. Okay, I'll just give it another five seconds, maybe 10 seconds to get some more responses. Okay, so it seems most people have used Revit on just one or two projects. Um, that's good to know. And then I would also like to know um, if you have any knowledge on um, what LOD is, so I am going to launch another poll. And you can just indicate to me if you specify the LOD on your BIM projects. I'm just going to give it another few seconds. Okay, so the results seem to be as I had expected. Most of you said, I don't know what that is. So uh, congratulations, you are in the right place. Because uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, so I'm just going to close the poll and then we'll move on with the presentation. So uh, just to give you a quick run through of the agenda, I'm going to just run through um, our previous webinar of the series uh, titled Kickstart Your River Journey. And then I'm just going to do a bit of an introduction talking about the I in BIM um, and how that then will relate to why the level of development is important, understanding what it is, why we use it and how we use it. Then I will move into the um, talking about uh, details that would be typically included in your model, information that is included in your model, um, and how you can use those things to enhance the value of your model, as well as housekeeping. And then I'm just going to wrap it all up talking a little bit about the BIM execution plan. And before ending the webinar, I will just open up for some questions. So last week, uh, my colleague Anin talked about kickstarting your river journey. Uh, if you missed it, um, there will be a link in the webinar um, once this video is uploaded to YouTube and you can find it on our YouTube channel. Uh, but just to give you a summary, she shared some nice tips and tricks on how to work with and how to set up a project template as it is one of the biggest ways to increase the, pro the productivity at the start of a project. Um, 
a lot of items can be pre-populated in your template, um, including most commonly used families, as well as uh, view templates and view filters. And as you are progressing on your BIM journey, it is also important to keep in mind that um, developing these templates is often an ongoing endeavor, and uh, also it's never too late to start. And um, another key takeaway from her webinar was that you can use a completed project as a template um, for your future projects. And after two or three projects, you can work toward creating a master Revit project uh, for yourself or for your department. Um, and it will then become like a, a standard basically for everyone to use. Um, so, so now that you have set out on your river journey, um, you are aware of all the possibilities that are out there in terms of creating models and producing construction drawings uh, in Revit. But more than that, um, you can use Revit to manage information um, in your project from conception all the way through construction. I always tell people who are making a move from AutoCAD to Revit that Revit is not a drawing tool in the same way that AutoCAD is. Uh, Revit is more a managing tool, I would say, um, that has drawing functionalities. And when you look at it that way, you approach your modeling and uh, BIM as such um, in a different way. But what, what is BIM? Um, if you've been following us and keeping up with things in the building industry, you would, you would have asked yourself at some stage, what is this BIM that people are talking about and, and why? Uh, so in short, BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. Uh, some people might say that it's the new buzzword in the architecture, engineering, engineering and construction industry. But in fact, it is not that new. Um, it's also not synonymous with Revit. Uh, sometimes um, people might call and say, I want to boom and then be like, okay, what do you mean? Um, or sometimes customers or people that I talk to who just say, um, yeah, no, we do boom. And then I'll be like, okay, how do you boom? Uh, so, so using Revit or having a project account on BIM360 or BIM3 Docs doesn't necessarily mean that you are booming, so to speak. Um, the I, I think, in BIM is really the key concept um, with regards to understanding what BIM is. Um, you know, as AC professionals, we are constantly working with information, uh, building information in particular. Uh, you know, the, the architect is giving information to engineers, and they are both giving information to the QS, who is also giving information to the client. And most importantly, everyone is giving information to the contractor, um, who really brings all the ideas to life. Uh, all this information, um, which may be in different formats, uh, are relating to the building project in question. And ideally, this information is collated in the form of a model. Um, when you have building information that is uh, interoperable between uh, various building professionals and other stakeholders like clients or even some of the authorities, then you are practicing BIM. So the information must be reliable, it must be relevant, and it must be accessible and transferable for it to mean anything to anyone. So in this webinar, I'm going to focus on the way that information is sorted and presented in your Revit model, and um, ultimately in a way to enhance the value of your model. Uh, but um, just coming back to, you know, what it is that we do, um, besides running analysis and, and drafting details and creating models, a lot of the time um, our actual work is just making decisions. And these decisions materialize in various ways, depending on your role, uh, but they are decisions that ultimately will dictate the outcome of a project. Designers, drafters, project planners and project owners make thousands of decisions uh, which may be in the form of a calculation, a drawing or schedule or budget, and it's difficult to make good decisions without good data. And the key takeaway from this image here is that good data is the foundation of making good decisions. When data is collated and compiled, we then have information. And if this information is in the right format and it's accessible by the right people, then those people have knowledge. And having this relevant knowledge is then what drives us to make good decisions um, that are also informed and ultimately lead to the success of the project, because that's ultimately what we're all trying to achieve. 
Here you see a typical uh, traditional project life cycle, starting from the client's inception all the way to handover and maintenance. This is a typical waterfall uh, structure and it's very linear and it may be more realistic um, sometime back where construction didn't start until final designs and drawings were ready. Um, so here you can see that the stages are very nicely delineated with a little bit of overlap here in there, um, but uh, this is probably more realistic. Um, what you will find on, on a project um, where sometimes even during final design or construction um, someone could come up with a new idea or maybe find out that there is a new regulation to comply with and whether that's the client, the architect or the engineer, this means that various parts of your building or your project can be in various stages at one time. And as the designer or the modeler or the drafter, it can become very haphazard and frustrating to manage all this information while you're also having to produce designs and drawings. And um, especially if you're a new modeler and you're also learning um, lots of new things as you go along, um, it's, it becomes frustrating when you don't fully understand what the expectations is of the final product. Um, and that's where LOD comes in, uh, because understanding the levels of development, or LOD for short, um, helps you to outline the expectations when you use a Revit model to develop construction drawings. And it also helps you, the author of the model, to draw the line in the sand on what is too much um, information or what is too little information um, in the model. So um, let's get a little bit more into it. Um, you know what about what it actually is. So it's LOD um, is commonly understood as level of detail, but it's probably more accurate to refer to it as level of development um, of a particular model. And sometimes the two is used interchangeably, but strictly speaking, uh, there is a difference. And why it's important to understand what these terms mean is because it essentially sets the bar for how much work you and your team are intending to put into your model. And more than that, level of development is comprised of both level of detail as well as level of information. So let's say you are in the design de development phase for a bridge or some type of structural platform that requires a girder to span between two supports. Um, at the start, you might know that there will be a structural girder, but you have no details yet in terms of size or geometry. So you might just indicate it with something like this, just to show that there will be something. Um, then after some time, you get more information about the span and the loading requirements, and you are able to size the member um, so you know that it will look something like this. At this level of detail, you can confidently specify the size the, and the position. Um, and then after some more time passes, um, some consideration is needed for coordination with adjacent structural members. So you then will need to include other information um, that is critical, such as connection details in your model. Um, so something like this, where you can see these casting plates um, that will be used to fix the girder to its supports, and also some rebar that sticks out that will be cast in with a slab. Um, and then you can even take it a step further in your model and include um, details such as rebar and post tension strands, and it will look something like this. And this is all the information typically that is required for construction. Um, and we always, I mean, up until now, we always um, issue this type of this information to the contractor because this is what he needs for successful erection of the project. But we can issue this information in various ways. It can be um, strictly in the Revit model or it can be a combination of the Revit model and another program. Um, but now we need to decide, okay, how are we going to separate the two? What are we going to include in the Revit model? Because of course, including the repo takes way more time and effort than if you were just to create that little block right at the bottom. So the BIM forum over the years has developed um, like a kind of a guideline that describes um, what is required at the various LOD levels. And they've also given it um, uh, names that are commonly referred to in the industry. And these would range from LOD, starts at 100 actually, but the examples here start from LOD 200 um, to LOD 400. So um, with LOD 200, uh, just gives an indication that there's some kind of horizontal structural member. LOD is where you specify the size and geometry. Um, LOD 
350 is where the connection details are included and then um, LOD 400 is all the information that is required for construction. Um, in the past, and you'll still find in some literature, the LOD levels go up to five or 600, but it's commonly accepted that this is way over what is normally required for construction. Um, LOD 5 and 600 would be applicable for asset or facility management um, while the building is operation. Um, and then these levels, they don't have to be strictly defined the way that I just described. Um, in some ways, LOD is kind of like a moving target. Um, it's also up to you as a team or as a company to decide um, how you will define each of these levels. But what is most important is that the team sits down together to discuss, um, to discuss this and then make decisions on what information will be included um, in, the, in the model. Um, it's also important to understand that the whole model does not have to be dictated by one LOD level. For example, it's a bit much to say to a consultant, I want the entire model to be in at LOD 350. Uh, it's more useful to say, I want all the structural beams and piers to be at LOD 350, and the rest of the structural elements can be LOD 300. Um, and uh, so in that way, you won't be spending your time modeling every single nitty-gritty item that really doesn't add any value to your model. Um, so understanding LOD understand, helps you to understand what elements in your model is going to actually bring value to you as a team and to your project. Besides the visual detail uh, that is in your model, information can also be included in your model elements um, as object properties. And planning this will also help uh, with your scheduling um, information and scheduling quantities and also producing other uh, construction information. So, for example, you can include some identity data um, referring to the structural member. Um, you can give it a name so that when you need to communicate about something, perhaps a change later on, you everybody knows exactly which member you're referring to in the building. Perhaps. Um, there are um, various construction phases, you can um, indicate that there as well. Um, and then some other things like the use of the member and some other information relating to the rebar cover. And of course, this would be for any, um, any discipline um, that you are uh, working with in particular. So um, just a little summary of the LOD levels according to the BIM forum. LOD 100 would be like very conceptual, so it's not even like in 3D, it's maybe just like a line or a note or something of a sort. Um, LOD 200 is when you have um, an approximate geometry. LOD 300 would be your precise geometry, you know the exact size and the location of this member. LOD 350 is all the information that you would need for coordination. So um, if you're talking about ducts or um, generators or anything, you need to include um, not only the size and its position, but also maybe information regarding its clearance, um, clearance height or clearance distances so that other disciplines are able to coordinate their elements with yours. Um, and then LOD 400 would be all the information that is requirement for the contractor to build these um, elements. And then LOD 5 and 600 is for the phases beyond construction that relates to um, uh, um, asset and facility management. So maybe things like uh, maintenance plans or when to service the equipment, um, things like that can also be included in your model. But when do you actually want to do that? When do you want to um, include more uh, detail in your model? And it's important to ask yourself that um, because um, you have to you have to consider you know is it worthwhile to spend this extra time um, to model this 20 mil diameter cable um, you know what is it going to do is it going to improve communication is it going to improve collaboration or coordination for myself the team and the project um, if it is not then maybe it's not worthwhile to spend the extra time so um, you want to think about, okay, what is going to give success in the project? Success would be a function of your time, the cost and the scope. So if modeling something in Revit is costing you time, it's costing you um, money and increasing the scope, then um, in relation to that, it should also be increasing one of those three Cs as well. If it's not, then maybe it's not worthwhile. Um, 
And then also one of the other reasons that we want to specify the LOD um, and have an understanding of the expectation is so that there is, um, the expectation is managed between individuals um, so that you know what information is being put in your model and you know what information uh, you're getting out. And um, a lot of the time, um, you need to include certain details in your model. So I'm just going to spend some time um, talking about different ways that you can include um, um, additional information or details in your model. Um, to in, to in improve the, or enhance the value of your model, there's a bunch of different things that you can do, but I'm specifically going to focus on um, including detail um, on some of your elements. So there's three um, different approaches uh, that you could take. You could model everything in 3D. So here you see an example of um, some block work. You see that the um, topography and the site um, terrain has been modeled, the brickwork has been modeled, the insulation has been modeled, the wall dies has been modeled, the dowels and rebar has been um, modeled. There's also some subsurface drainage that has been modeled. So you can imagine <laughs> the time and the effort that that took. But obviously the advantage of that is that you can now go and make a section and you can tag all of these elements because all the information is intelligent, right? So that's, that, is, that is a big one. Um, to be able to have all that information readily available and if there's any changes that are made in the model everything will adjust accordingly so that's all good and well um, the other approach is modeling only like the, the basic or the, the the most critical elements in your model so in this example you see a slab has been modeled together with some foundations um, the walls and also uh, like a, a glass or aluminium door or something of the sort but it's really just like the basic the basic elements um, in this building and then um, to to um, actually issue this for construction we do need to add some details right because the contractor needs to know this information um, about whatever stitching stitch rebar or dowels is needed about insulation um, about waterproofing dam proofing and all of those things so in this example um, this has been added using detail items in, in Revit and then the other way, which is a little bit um, more stripped down, is you have the absolute, absolute basic elements in your model. And then um, as for the details, the details is done maybe in um, AutoCAD as in a 2D program, and the two are not linked, right? The uh, 2D information is separate from 3D information. So just in summary, um, we've got the scenario where everything was modeled and annotated in the model with intelligent tags. So everything is linked. Then we got the second approach where all the main elements are modeled and then it is just embellished with detailed components in Revit. And then the third scenario where you've got the, the very, very basic 3D elements and then you have some 2D um, uh, details that has got no reference to your actual model. So you might be using one of these three or you might be using a combination of these three. And um, like I said, they all have the, um, the pros and cons. Uh, one of the pros of doing it, um, the third way with having your 2D details is that maybe you have already developed this uh, previously in CAD and you've got these standards. But that's not necessarily the most intelligent way to make use of your Revit model because the information is separated. And sometimes you can end up um, with um, information that is not consistent. So how would you enhance these details in the third scenario and maybe try and achieve uh, the second scenario where you model the main elements of the building and then you just embellish it with the uh, detail components. So I'm going to um, just give a demonstration of um, how you can do this. So basically what the demonstration is going to show is taking your 2D details um, and putting it into Revit in in 2D as well, but just in a more intelligent way. So I will do that by adding detail components using detail tags. Um, in the example, I'm also going to create a detail legend, um, create a callout, and then use this callout to reference um, the repeated typical details. Okay, so so this is a uh, just a basic um, little project. It's just like a little house. Um, and you can see that all the basic elements have been modeled. There's some walls, there's a floor, there's doors and windows and a roof and some rafters. 
um, but you don't see any other information um, relating to uh, details or finishes. So this is um, just like a layout of the floor and now we want to include this uh, detail, this 2D detail um, in our model and um, related to the correct position. So if I just take a section on this wall where that detail is meant to be um, and go in there you'll see that um, there's nothing. Um, you know, because it's just a wall that has been modeled. I'm just going to switch this off because um, we're not concerned with toilets. <laughs> okay, and then just uh, change some properties to make it a bit easier to see in all the details. Okay, and now I'm just going to create a call out because I want to just show a typical foundation detail in this portion of the section. And if I go to this view, you'll see that it, it just zooms into that portion. And you also see that there's no foundation. The foundation wasn't modeled there. Okay, so this is the call out. I'm just extending the view. And now I want to just add the foundation. So um, I like to do this in 3D, but you can do it in any view. Um, so I'm just going to select the right strip fitting and then start to place it below each of the walls. Okay, I've got all of my walls. Okay, and if I go to this view now, I can see that the footing has been added. Then I need to add um, the, the, the details relating to what mesh goes in there and um, some of the subgrade information. So I'm just going to rename this to typical foundation. You'll see that this view is available under the sections tab in the in the project browser. And then I'm going to start off with just um, just um, indicating the the slab level. So this is um, just one of the out of the box um, annotations, but I like to have a prefix uh, to, uh, saying TOC, it's up to you. You can leave it out or maybe t have top of slab. I'm just changing this to a final detail and changing the scale to one is 10 so that the text is um, not so big. And then just going to delete the, the leaders there because I want the arrow to be right there and just move the text about to make it a bit more readable. Okay, so now I need to add a detail component. So instead of modeling in the mesh, I'm going to use a detail component um, to indicate that there has to be some kind of bent up um, mesh in there. So I just use the space bar to rotate this element. This is the default shape, but because it's an intelligent um, component, I can go and I can um, edit it. So just need to fix this here. This is actually 10 mils ply. And now I want to create a new one that is as an 8 mil diameter. Say OK, and now I just need to adjust uh, the length of this bar. So it's going to be 50 on that side, and then I'll just make it one meter. It's going to extend this length. So this is just a detail item. It's not an actual um, rebar element. If you are doing rebar in your model, this won't be included in your schedule. Um, so it's, it's a 2D element, but it's got some intelligent information attached to it. Uh, so now I'm just putting this um, indicating this mesh on the, in the other slab as well. Okay. And here you can see um, that I can now describe what this is. So this is mesh ref um, 393. And if I look at the information for this, because it's the same type of element, it has the same details. Okay, so that's going to make things a lot easier when I start tagging. Now I need to add um, need to add that little joint there and also the uh, subsurface material. So I'm going to uh, do this with a detail component again. So all of these are out of the box um, details. Some of them are edited. Some of them you need to manipulate. So. OK, 
Okay, so I'm just moving that over. Okay, so the next thing to to add is the um, the compacted fill that's below. So I have or I sort of modified this um, just before the demonstration, but it's easy to just if you if you understand families, you'll be able to do this. Um, otherwise, you can just use the out of the box um, detail components. Um, now, next, I want to just uh, indicate the in situ material with a different pattern. So you could do this with hatches too, but um, hatches don't have intelligent information that you can tag. So that's the reason that we're using this. And also you can go and you can change um, some of the key visual properties. Okay, so now I am going to add the uh, DBM. So I'm just going to offset it by 10 moles. I need to start on the other side. Here we go. The same on the other side. Okay, so now I've indicated my DPM with a line, but I can see because this is a detailed component, I can add a description to say um, what kind of material it should be. And now when I start to tag my detailed components, I can just uh, use the annotation tag and I don't have to manually type in text to describe each of these things. So I'm just going to fiddle around here and just make it a bit more readable. Okay, so that disappears because the um, annotation region needs to be extended. Okay, I need to tag these um, now, but you can see that there's a question mark and there's a question mark because that information um, wasn't assigned yet. So I'll just go and add it and I'll keep it the description. So let me just check that is the compacted full. Okay. Okay, again, I just need to extend my crop region. Just move this out of the way. Okay, and now I need to um, still name this region. Just move this. Okay, so I'll add that in the type mark so that it can appear in the tag. So that is in situ material compacted to 93%. Okay, and I just need to adjust the sticks over here. Okay. 
Okay, so now if I tag the other side, the same information will come up. Um, and I'm just going to fix that. But um, I have another option beside, uh, instead of tagging or using text is, I can actually also just create like a legend because um, that's typical types of um, materials that will be used uh, throughout the project. So maybe creating a legend is a good idea. So in this example, I'm just going to demonstrate that. I'm also going to demonstrate how to use a break line as a detail component. Uh, so I need to just load it. And the, a break line is one of the out of the box detail components that are available. So you need to uh, it gets downloaded automatically when you download um, your Revit. Um, so you just need to navigate to the Autodesk folder and then Revit, um, libraries, uh, uh, not annotations, I just need to go back, detail items, and breakline will be under general, and then, oops, not that one. I need to just select the break line. There we go. And now I can place the break line. So I'm just going to use the space bar to rotate it so that it shows in the correct um, direction. And then maybe just make some adjustments so that it looks correct on the drawing. Okay, maybe I should move that break line so that it cuts through the material as well. So I can just shift that over. And then move that down. Okay, that looks a bit more reasonable. Okay, so now you see I could either tag these two but instead I want to create a legend um, just to illustrate how that is done using detail components. So this legend is going to be for the subsurface uh, material and I'm going to make the scale match the scale of the detail so that the patterns are the same size. And you can see that the legend is in the project browser. You can once again go to insert detail component, select the material, and then just draw a little square. And then I need to do the next one, which is the insert your material. make it the same size. Okay, so now instead of adding text, I can now um, go ahead and tag these as well. And now you have consistency, you have the same pattern uh, with the same text description, and um, it really just limits inconsistency of information in your drawing. Okay, so I'm just coming back to my detail. Okay, so legends, however, you cannot place on views, you can only place it on sheets. So this is going to be my sheet. I'm going to put my plan view on the sheet. And then I will put the typical detail on the sheet as well. And then the legend. I'll put it somewhere here in the corner. Just move that title. And then over here, I can just remove these tags 
and my drawing is maybe a bit less heavy with text and you can just refer to the legend to um, know what material um, is below the slab. Okay, so just keeping in mind that that typical foundation detail was created with a callout and that callout is referenced to that section. So now I'm just going to include that section on this drawing as well. We can make it a bit bigger. Okay, and you can see that that call out if would be a reference to the typical foundation detail. And that, of course, would be repeated um, on all four of the external walls. So what I can do now is I can go and I can reference that call out um, without having to redraw it. Um, that's the wrong one. It needs to be a section. So we'll go view, section, reference, another view. The view that I want to reference is the typical foundation detail that I just created. And I can indicate with a section mark that it will be on that wall as well. And I'm going to do the same for the other two walls. So I will just reference that typical foundation detail. And the same for the last one. And you can see that there is a text sim for similar, meaning that it's a reference view. You can go and you can edit it or you can leave it there. But you'll see that when I now select this section and go to view, it references that detail that I just created without having to redraw it. So now all the information on my drawing is related to each other. Nothing is chippoed, nothing. If I make one change, it will reflect in all of the views. Um, and the information is reliable. And you can do the same um, for the detail at the rafter if you wish. And there's a whole bunch of other detail components that you can use um, uh, to, to describe what happens there, maybe like insulation or a, um, or, um, a for the, the waterproofing or gutters or anything like that. So um, that's it for the demonstration. Um, so just to summarize um, uh, what we did, we created a, a typical foundation detail using detail components in Revit. Um, and then we also created a um, legend using the detail components. And that is really just to take advantage of the intelligence of it so that um, you don't use any text or um, 2D lines that have no information. So not once did I use a line or um, any manual text. Um, so this is if you want it to be 2D, you don't want it to be in your 3D model, it's 2D, but it's still intelligent. Um, the rule of thumb, don't use any lines, don't use text. Um, use detail tags uh, because you can um, input information into whatever custom information you want and it will uh, represent in the tags. And if you update it on one, it will update on all of your drawings. Um, and this allows consistency in appearance, consistency in information, even spelling, and it just limits um, mistakes and incorrect information. Uh, you can use the out-of-the-box detail components as a starting point, uh, but you will have to edit and modify them according to your company or local standards. Um, but it's a good start and um, it's nice um, for your changes and your updates uh, to be more streamlined. So um, the example was creating a detailed view, um, but it's also to understand, uh, important to understand that there's a difference between detail and drafting views um, and, and when to use them. So in the detail view, um, it's something that, um, that you create using a callout or a section. And um, when you create um, create it as a call out. The detail can can be both in a section, or you can and call out annotations can be assigned to it. Um, so it will show up in all of the 
sections and you can also then reference it um, in various locations especially with the typical detail and all of the detailed views you can find in your project browser and if you make a change in the project model um, you can just adjust the detail view accordingly so um, these two tabs under the view tab section and call out is where you would do your detail views your drafting views however um, are not associated with the model it's purely um, 2d so you can use the same 2d tools and you can also use um, uh, detail components but it will have no reference to the actual model um, so you also will find this in your project browser and the drafting views and um, this is also something that you can drag onto the sheet so an example where you would use a drafting view instead of a detail view is maybe a carpet transition detail which shows where the carpet switches the tile or maybe like a saw cut um, joint detail or, or something we you're not heavily um, dependent on the model and drafting views are found under the same view tab and there's a um, little button that uh, creates the drafting view in your project browser so talking about the out of the box detail families like i mentioned there's a whole bunch of them um, and it's under program data in your c drive if you don't see program data it's because it's hidden so you just have to unhide it and you can find these detail items and you can see this examples at the bottom is of malians that is i mean these types of things to draw it it might be like so much of a mission but you can really just find it there or create your own using um, your cad drawings um, so it's a good starting point um, and it might not have everything that you need, um, but like I said, it's a good start. And um, one of the things is uh, just you might want to play around with the object styles um, and the line weights um, so that it presents in your drawing the way that you want it. And if you're using keynoting, um, all of the out of the box uh, keynotes are aligned with the default keynote file um, of Autodesk, so you can make use of it or just leave it out. Um, and if you want to use element tagging then the families will have to be included to include the desired information which i'll talk more about just now and but despite the method that you choose um, a new keynote or detail item tag will probably need to be created um, if it doesn't match what you need so what about the information of the model we just talked about detail and different ways to include detail so information can be um, presented um, in different ways um, so you can just use the normal tagging um, but there's also some other tags that you can use the first one being a uh, keynote tags which um, can represent either a keynote number or keynote text as shown in the example here the limitation here is that you can only um, tag either the keynote number or text but not both and you have to rely on schedules to reference the relevant information uh, so this can be very useful for things like finishes and material information but in other cases um, you might want to make use of um, type comment tags instead so this allows you to add custom information to your model um, uh, and um, also to the detail components so the tags in this example here is not manual text um, they are custom tags just like uh, the previous example um, with uh, custom information so um, you can see for example these information like 100 millimeter digit insulation extends 600 mils minimum from exterior face of all so um, using this method requires some knowledge of how to create and edit families uh, by adding type parameters to the families um, so that you can tag it and if you're not familiar with how to do this a quick google can help or you can simply just give us a call to find out how you can learn about doing this and then another nice thing that i learned recently myself is that you can add hyperlinks uh, via symbols on a plan and section views in your model so if you play around with a sample project that is available um, with your river download then you'll see some blue buttons next to certain elements on the model and when you click um, one of them uh, you'll see that there is a hyperlink in the properties window um, that you can select and it will take you to a help page um, that describes how you can uh, model this rebar cage for example uh, so in the same way you can create custom buttons for you for yourself for your own project um, as a hyperlink to external information that you might want to share with someone else um, or use as reference for yourself so for example um, for example this uh, on this model 
So you'll see that is the one that comes with a sample project. So yeah, you'll see that those hyperlinks will take you to help files. This is one that I created um, to show manufacturing info. So if I click on this link, it will take me um, to a data sheet of what that, what brick should be used for that retaining wall. Okay, so that's quite nice and you can use it in various ways. It's completely customizable, um, but I thought that was a nifty trick. And then with regards to information, I think um, schedules is probably one of the main main things uh, where you can collect the information in your model and there's um, the various types of schedules. Um, you can um, use it to present nested information as well. Um, you can use it for keynotes. Um, you can use it to specify fixtures by space. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail and my next webinar will be um, talking about how you can use schedules um, in Revit to enhance um, to enhance the value of your of your model. Um, but what I will talk about next is just like a little bit of housekeeping, um, because as you model, you'll see that your model can become very messy if you're not um, cautious about um, and intentional about um, the information that you have in your model. And I think the first thing is um, uh, deciding on a file naming convention. Um, so after a while, just a few months of creating new projects, creating new families, um, new material types, you might end up not knowing which is the latest, which is the right one to use and things like that. So I would really advise to come up with a naming convention that has like um, a code or a symbol at, as a prefix uh, to describe what it is. And it would be useful to apply a consistent naming convention for things like your project files, your template files, families, um, sheet names, view names and annotation names. And then I'm just going to go quick through the list very quickly. Um, so the other thing that I also do advise in terms of housekeeping is keeping a nice neat project browser. So if you look at the project browser on the left, um, you'll see that there's no consistency in naming of the views. Um, I'm not really sure if I was looking for something, uh, which file to select. And um, as your project becomes very big, you can find yourself scrolling and scrolling for days. So for that reason, um, I would highly recommend to um, look into using filters to organize your project browser in a way that is more clear and um, uh, more systematic. And I mean, also talked about this in a previous webinar, and it's also something that we cover in our BIM specialist series. Um, but that could be quite useful. And then the last um, little bit of tip for housekeeping that I would um, recommend is to make use of purging unused objects. So it's very similar to the AutoCAD purge. Um, and like this guy that is so stressed out here, it's easy to feel the same way about your model um, if it's very messy. So ideally you want to remove unused views, unused families and other objects um, to improve the performance of your model as well as reduce the file size. Um, also, it would be good practice just to create a backup before the purge, just in case. Um, and then another thing is that all the work sets uh, should be open when you do the purge. And um, if you're still stressed about it, um, it's not possible to purge any objects um, that are in use or are dependent or other objects are dependent on. Um, and then you can also select and deselect um, items that you want or don't want to purge. And then this is where you would find it. You would go to the Manage tab and then under Settings, um, the second last tool, Purge Unused, is what you would use. So what you want to avoid is this before scenario. After purging, you'll end up with a nice neat closet and in the same way that it's easier to get dressed in a, in a closet that's um, neat and tidy, it will be easier to, um, uh, to navigate your model and uh, produce your construction drawings. So lastly, um, I just want to touch on the BIM execution plan. Uh, we talked about a bunch of things relating to how we relay information with each other in a particular project. Um, most of the time, um, we just uh, 
sort of operate on the fly, um, but having a BIM execution plan at the start of your project helps you to um, set out expectations and have everybody on the same page of what is required from our Revit model and how are we going to produce um, the construction drawings. So um, here at Baker Baines, we see a lot of value in the implementation of the BOM execution plan. Um, although it's not your actual Revit model, it certainly augments your Revit model very well, and it's a good first step to enhancing the value of the information in your Revit model. A good question to ask yourself is, what information do I need to make my job easier? And can I trust the data I receive and the data that I put forward? And the follow-on to that would be, okay, if not, or I'm not really sure, but what measures can I put in place to ensure that I can trust the information coming out of the model? And um, to get the answers from these questions, a good place would be to mandate it is in the BIM execution plan, and then as well, and then also create a culture um, where it is actually implemented as a company um, standard. So you would also include the details of housekeeping measures that uh, should be practiced throughout the modeling process and also how often you should do that. Um, and this might seem like a secondary task, uh, but I promise it will add so much value um, to your Revit model. Uh, just like when the check engine light pops up on your car, uh, choosing to ignore it or act on it can lead to a different outcome um, a few years down the line. And just as regularly servicing your car increases the reliability of your car and it even increases the resale value uh, when you do decide to sell it, uh, implementing best modeling practice and uh, model housekeeping too will enhance the value of your Revit model. So uh, thank you for that. I hope I didn't uh, take up too much of your time. I know I am a little bit over, um, but I, I would now like to just open up to some questions. Um, I will just check the chat box over here to see if there are any just yet. So I'm not seeing any questions. I hope that means that everything was clear. <laughs> okay, so if there's no questions, um, I just will then like to close off um, uh, just talking about like Bains, the industries that we, we serve. Um, I talked a lot about building um, examples, but uh, besides the building industry, we also serve uh, the civil uh, process plant mining and energy fields. And really what we try to do is um, help our customers to solve their problems through digital transformation to help you design and make a better world. And um, if you would like to get in contact with us, uh, this is our details. We've got an office in Cape Town as well as one in Joburg. And um, please feel free to follow us on social media. Um, we, we post a lot of updates and our future webinars. And um, also, uh, this video will be available on our YouTube channel if you would like to review anything or maybe share it with a friend. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you for joining me in this webinar today. I hope that it will be useful to you at some point. And if you have any questions or would like to reach out, um, these, this is my information and our social media handles. And um, that is it for this Friday afternoon. Thank you, everyone, and uh, enjoy your weekend.